Welcome to Talking Tuesdays. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today's guest is Auguste Sugianto. I actually met Auguste a few years back at an American Bankers Association's risk conference. Uh, a colleague of mine actually worked with him before at Bank of America, and so he introduced me to him. The big surprising fact for me was that my colleague mentioned, you know, he is the executive vice president of Model Risk. Um, so that fancy title means he is the head of all of model risk or validation, as we like to call it, uh, in the banking side. But after about a five, maybe 10 minute conversation with a goose, I was really surprised by his technical knowledge. So a lot of times when you get up higher, higher inside of these banking organizations, it is very rare to be able to keep your technical skills and often those soft skills that are required and needed at such a high level um, are outweighed for the technical skills. So you usually see a lot of executives that are very well-rounded, but a goose is one of these really rare individuals where he has extreme technical knowledge and depth and can hold a conversation, which you'll see here in this interview. We can talk about very nitty gritty detail uh, pieces within you know the technical realms, um, but he also has those you know very charismatic, well-rounded management skills. You'll see too as well, he is very passionate about what he does. He is always happy and always excited. So without any further ado, let's just dive on into this interview. Let's just start off this whole podcast here with what is your your background here? A quick introduction to who you are. All right. Thank thank you, Dimitri, first of all. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I, I need to put disclaimer first here, you know, so the... Uh, the uh, the conversation today is personal, uh, you know, for me. Uh, I'm not representing uh, the com any company, you know. So, because I'm going to say I'm working for well, uh, uh, my background, my current role, my current role, I I am the uh, head of corporate model risk for Wells Fargo. Uh, what it means is really I do oversight for all model in Wells Fargo before they go to production. So model has to go through the team, uh, my team, and get tested before anything can go to production. So I do oversight as well for all model development uh, to make sure that they 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 are they're following our model risk management process. So that's my background. As I've been in that role for almost it's all, a little bit over seven years now. So, uh -huh. but before that, I was across the pond. I was in Europe. I was the uh, uh, the uh, director of analytics for Lloyd Banks. Uh, Lloyd is kind of like the Wells Fargo of England, of U United Kingdom. So they do uh, retail and commercial banks just like Wells Fargo in the, uh, in the US. So three years across the pond. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, about seven years with Bank of America. I was in uh, leading a uh, quantitative risk. This is model development team in, uh, in corporate risk. And I have, uh, that's, that's uh, before that I was on the, on the, on the bright side before I moved to the dark side of finance. So, so I was a, uh, a design manager, a design uh, engine for Ford Motor Company. Uh, okay. engine system for Ford Motor Company. Uh, I was with the company for a long time, so uh, ten plus years with the uh, with Ford Motor Company. So that's wow. the uh, so so a, a detour, you know. After <laughs> ten years, I uh, I detour, I, I went dark. <laughs> okay, so you started off to your undergrad, and you're from Indonesia, right? Yes, I am. Yes, okay, I, and yes, your undergrad degree is from Indonesia. What did you get your degree in? Uh, physics, but physics is physics is for smart people, uh, Dimitri. Physics is very hard, you know. Yeah. So, so I from physics I went to engineering because engineering is much easier than physics. That's good to know. I've kind of wondered. I've I've dabbled in the physics side for personal interests, but I've yeah, I've never taken those official, you know, intense college courses in physics. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then you, after your undergrad, then you ended up coming to the United States mm. and you ended up going to Wayne State University, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a long history on that because uh, at that time I applied for uh, research assistantship 
basically uh, at Ford Motor Company, right? So research assistantship at Ford Motor Company, basically what I do is I, I, I did research 20 hours per week, just like any research assistant in university. Well, I have to go to school. So so the uh, the school that uh, Ford at that time collaboration work is with, with, with wind states, you know, because wind state is just, uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes away from Dearborn where Ford Motor Company is. So, so that's how, how I end up at Wayne State is, uh, is really uh, the, uh, the assistantship that led me through, you know, to, uh, to the school. Okay. Did you, what made you leave Indonesia? Did you come for like a specific opportunity or are you just looking for more opportunities? Well, it's, it's really looking more opportunity and challenge. So the biggest thing is really, really challenge, you know, to, 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 uh, for graduate school, basically. So my intent at that time was purely uh, advancement on the education. Okay. Okay. And you have a master's and a PhD, correct? From Wayne yes. State? Yes. It's a, the master's is in what degree? Uh, my education is a little bit messy, you know, so I'm from physics. I went to industrial engineering, right? So my 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 master was in industrial engineering, uh, but I feel like it's not mathematicals enough. So I need uh, somewhat more technical. So when I did PhD, I make a detour. I went to uh, into uh, into double E, okay? And because the uh, the double E at that time at Wayne State is this side of the building uh, is industrial engineering faculty. Just across the aisle is electrical engineering faculty, right? So okay, <laughs> I want to do uh, do more math. So so that's what I ended up with. And my PhD is kind of like I have a uh, uh, my main uh, advisor is from from electrical engineering at that time. Okay, so you have uh, basically the perfect quant background because everybody always asks me. They say, Dimitri, what's the path to being a quant? And I always <laughs> tell them. The best quants come from the most random areas. They always oh, it's very random. Yeah, I mean, I've seen. So you look at like um, Emmanuel Derman was in physics, and if you read his book, he talks about you know he couldn't find a job and he wanted to be a physicist at a university. Mm -hmm. and then of course his wife is doing amazing things in academia and she's employed, and yep. then eventually he gives up and just goes into finance. Yeah. And then I've had other other colleagues similar. They start out in like forestry or something and then they deviate through time and they end up in finance again and yeah. i think i think the best quants always have kind of that kind of that detour path we've been talking about they bounce from one area to another area right right yeah. so it's, it's 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 that if you if you look at it this is where where it's interesting when i did my phd uh that was in the early 90 right so i feel old now uh <laughs> okay so you make me feel old so in the early 90 and i work in neural networks at that time, you know, the early day of neural networks, right? Yeah, before so, the hype. <laughs> before the hype. So when I when I wrote my dissertation, I wrote my dissertation on the autoencoding before such thing of autoencoding. I did independent component analysis before such thing of independent comp uh, component analysis and manifold learning before such thing of manifold learning, right? So all of those things. Uh, so, and then when you graduated, it's no such job as a machine learning job at that time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No oh, yeah. such job. No such job. So so I ended up as an engineer at Ford Motor Company, right? So mm -hmm. so I ended up with the uh, uh, working on the uh, started with reliability engineering and then I moved uh, in, in, in powertrain and engine design and they become engine design and I lead engine design team, you know. So yeah. so and and at that time. You know, because my passion, my passion with, with 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 statistics and all of those things, uh, of course, we apply apply those to uh, to engine design. At that time, it's about robust robust design, probabilistic design, design optimization under uncertainty, and all of those things, right? Yeah. So that's what end up with my research. I abandon all the neural network stuff, okay? <laughs> because you cannot find a job, okay? In, in in that field at that time, so. So my field, even my, my research at that time was about design uh, of computer experiments. So at that time was, okay, if you wanna do robust design, real experiment is expensive and time consuming. Yeah. By the time you do real experiment, the design is done, right? So design yeah. has no impact. So you have, to, you have to turn it, that you have to apply design to computer model. 
to to finite element model to uh, to thermodynamics model to fluid mechanics model so that was my I, I and that okay this is the real world now i switched my field in that so actually if you look at my most publication and things are really in the design area you know so mm -hmm. publication be it in statistical journal or in asme i have a lot of uh, a lot of publication in asme uh, and uh, so that's that's what's interesting. So you, ad you adapt, you know, so from what you learned, this is what we need. So I, I did that in 2005. I think I published a book. It's a long time ago, published a book in Design and Analysis of Computer Experiments. So you can find it out still in Amazon today. So I was laughing, you know, the, the other day I got a, uh, uh, a check report how much the uh, the publisher uh, you know, sent me a check on the, on the thing. So, so that was way, way back then. But, you know, who, kn who knows, uh, uh, you know, 20 something years later, the field, the field is back. And, and this is what interesting. I published in, when I wrote my dissertation, uh, one of the topic in the dissertation was published in Neural Network Journal. Okay. 25 years later, I have another publication in Neural Network Journal that show up in this month. You know, so that's, <laughs> you know, that's a, long you time. Came, a long time because I went to a, to a different field. You know, I published in different field and then come back, you know, so I, same thing, I wrote something in IEEE a long time ago. Yeah. And it showed up in IEEE several months ago, you know, another publication in, in IEEE neural networks. So, so that kind of thing that's happening. Okay. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm kind of on the outside looking in on you because, so I went to the University of Michigan for my graduate degree, my yeah. master's. Yeah. Yeah. We were in, so financial engineering at the times where I started, we were in the engineering buildings. We had IOE. Yes. And it, then we had a data science machine learning program. And I remember walking by reading the board with the topics of neural nets, artificial networks, and things. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's crazy. That's there's no way that's going on. And that was in 2012. Yeah. And I remember those students were complaining the same thing. There's no jobs, no one will hire me. Like, what am I going to do when I graduate? Yes. It, yeah, within a few short years, it went from nobody hiring to everybody's hiring. Every, everybody science. hiring. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So this thing is just. Uh, amazing when 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 early 2000 i think the field was dead right because mm -hmm. hey uh, it's the time of uh, gradient boosting machine and support factor machine at that time right support vector machine so neural network is dead okay so now coming back very strong and then support factor machine nobody wants to touch it anymore <laughs> you know yeah exactly so how did you transition from working at ford motor company into the finance realm like what made you switch well it's uh this is the thing that i uh i i was always thinking about right so a very very few principle when you are in the year 20 you want to work all for somebody who's very smart so you learn as much as possible yeah. and then when you're in the 30 you're thinking about okay i learned enough either i want to do something continue on this or do you want to do something crazy, do something completely different? Because if you fail, you can still come back. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, so I decided that and the 30, okay. Suddenly I get a phone call from, from Bank of America. Hey, they want to do something here, be interested in your background. At that time, they're interested in process re-engineering or Six Sigma kind, you know, hey, I'm, I'm from engineering. I know this thing. I know how to do this thing. In fact, at that time, I was the first uh, among the first uh, master black belt, Six Sigma master black belt for Ford, right? So I got yeah. there, okay, and say, okay. Well, I, I was in Detroit, the weather is miserable, yeah. right? Oh yeah. 15 years in Detroit, <laughs> weather is miserable. And in summer weather nice, you get all the pothole in the construction all over. You know it, you probably oh, yeah. see that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I say, well, going south to North Carolina, this seems nice, you know? <laughs> You got nicer weather, and I you get paid more. This is the this is the uh, the guilt sometimes that I have. Okay, uh, and I really truly feel guilty, you know, because as an engineer at that time, the pay was not even close to the pay in banking. You okay. know, suddenly they show me so pile of money, 
yeah. right? Here I pay you more than double your salary, more than double your salary and go to nicer weather. So I went dark, that's what I said, because people don't never, never believe that one because people think that gasoline was in my blood. You know, I designed engine, all right? <laughs> so everybody know how passionate I was with engine design and suddenly I went, I went, I went dark, you know, I call it, I went dark, you know? So forget all the engineering, uh, go to uh, do the new challenge. But when you're thir uh, thir uh, 30 years, 30 something, you, you want to do that. You want to do something different because at that time I have experience of designing, uh, participating in designing totally brand new engine, different way through analytical model, through uh, design optimization using analytical model. And uh, very proud about this because when we, when it went out, the engine becoming the first one that we designed analytically came out as the top 10 best engine in the United States. So it's very proud. So, and then what else you wanna do, you know? Yeah. Engine design, designing a brand new engine, it only happened once every 15 or 20 years because it's very expensive to set up the manufacturing environment, you know? And so, uh, the smartest engineer will be at that time, at least it will be in powertrain, it will be engine design, you know, because that's where the challenge is. So they say, okay, what, what do you want to do? So we branch out to completely, totally different things. So that's how I end up. But when looking back, the principle are the same. You know, if you look at it, uh, all the, in quant finance, the equation, you do all diffusion equation. Well, we do it too when we design combustion engine using diffusion equation when we talk about heat transfer and all of those things. Uh -huh. and, and when we talk about credit risk, people default, fail to pay. It's the same thing. We talk about reliability things, product failure. So the math and the stat are the same. The uh -huh. application and the context are different. So coming to banking is, uh, and, and uh, uh, finance modeling, uh, it's, yeah, you have to learn the nomenclature things. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to offend anybody here, but if you want to, uh, in engineering, for example, if you want to learn stress analysis, you have to know static first. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you go to more, you know, you want to learn dynamic, you have to go through mechanics and all those things, you know. So to, to go to a 700 level course, you have to study the 200 level, 300, 400, 500, 600. In finance, you don't need that. Yeah. In finance, you want to learn 700 level book, grab 700 level book, you read it, you know it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. on my on my channel, I try to explain that to people. I think one of the reasons, like in America, we all think math is so hard, is that concept that in like STEM and math and stuff, it layers. So you can't do the 200 without the 100. Yes. And once once you get the 200 down, then you can, you can layer it on. But yeah. it's this layering process. And I have a finance background, so I completely understand. It's like I grab a textbook. I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn about, you know, value at risk today. And yeah. you can just dive in and read it and understand yes. it. And then you can just do something else. Exactly. Exactly. So it's very, very, very different, right? The uh, engineering or biology, you have to do layer over layer. Finance, you can jump straight to it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So let's shift gears here a little bit here. So you worked at... Bank of America, and you did Six Sigma to start with and doing basically efficiency. And then you ended up transferring into model development, right? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, when when we did efficiency at that time, I was working on the uh, also a big things at that time. You know, the uh, when America was criticized uh, by the regulator on the anti-money laundering. The, yes, the early day of anti-money laundering and all of those things where the field is really dominated by law enforcement people or lawyer on all those things. When you suddenly, you have a humongously, you have monitoring system, suddenly a lot of alert and you have to process thousand and thousand alert. You cannot hire army of people to do that, right? Yeah, so you exactly. have to do something smarter so that's what happened, you know, case backlog and all of those things at that time. Okay, we look at it. Okay, we're going to fix the process, but not only that we fix process, we have to put something, a system that will help it. So that's when, okay, we'll put modeling. So that was uh, put the uh, first, uh, and I have a patent on this and a while back and publication on this one as well, but really basically we're building all the early days of model in, in, in financial crime. And I look back sometimes and say, 
man, 15 years after I left that field, I, I honestly see not, not much progress in that field. So it's kind of embarrassing uh, when, I, when I look into that. So I hope that the field will move very fast with, with machine learning now. But we, I, I did, you know, machine learning before people do machine learning things in that. So, so that was, uh, I was in that. And then uh, from that, uh, the, uh, uh, at that time, the, uh, the chief uh, credit and market risk uh, looked at me and said, Agus, I think you've done enough of that one. So why don't now you we do more on the other side on uh, the quantitative risk that we uh, we haven't done much. So so that's where where say okay now you you run this thing you know you build a team and you run it. So that's where end up with the uh, on the credit side running uh, credit uh, credit modeling teams and building uh, the. The, the, the risk reward, the stress testing before we even talk about stress testing yeah. uh, at, at that time and risk reward, how to combine the revenue and loss and designing origination strategy, credit portfolio optimization, like just like the way we do portfolio optimization with, with, with our investment. So that was that was back then. So so switch uh, after finish the, uh, the project in a financial crime building entire system and modeling for financial crime, then move, move, move to credit. That's how, that's how I, I ended up with uh, going, went deep. And then after that, we, uh, not for long, once we have all those modeling and we're ready and all those things, the financial crisis hit, right? So yeah. then you put model in, the, in real test. Okay, yeah. how to how to use model to navigate uh, navigate crisis and uh, I have a lot of fun memories about this because I still have uh, several good friends in uh, in, in Peru America who 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 we do this thing uh, run this thing and we work on this and even this is how uh, how uh, you never know what happened in the future. I talk about the uh, neural network in my education and here, right? Yeah. So who knows that that. 12 years later, my boss today, the chief risk officer, so I report to the chief risk officer, was my peer at Bank of America at that time, right? So we work hand in hand together. Uh, at that time, she was the head of uh, home equity loan, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, risk. So uh, working hand in hand with her and all those things. Who knows, you know? So I made, I made the tour after P of A to Lloyds and Wells Fargo. She made a different detour to Ally Bank and JP Morgan and then Wells Fargo. Here we go. So, <laughs> so you never know. The, the key thing is, this is especially for, for, for the, uh, the younger generation. Always nice to everybody. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Always nice to everybody. Always try to, to help everybody. And that's because you never know. And I gave you another example. One of my direct report, his name is VJ Nair. He was, you from UFM, he was the uh, stat department chair for University of Michigan for maybe 15 years, right? Okay. I was a graduate student at that time at Ford, he has a graduate, his graduate student sit next to me. We were uh, doing co-op and research together, right? So Vijay was a big name at that time, the chair of statistic department. Who knows, like several, many years later, he worked for me, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it's, it's very important here for, for, for people that you have to treat other people with respect and, uh, and uh, be nice because you never know what happened in the future. Like myself, I work for somebody that we used to work together. So I, it's very enjoyable for me to, to, to work for, uh, for, for, for Manny Norton, uh, my boss as a chief risk officer, because we knew we have long history while back. Yeah, it's a really small world in general, because like you're saying, even from like Michigan, and even like in academia, then you kind of end up in the same industries. And even in the same industries, we kind of go between the same banks or everybody starts <laughs> kind of knowing each other and definitely Absolutely. building a good reputation is mm. a key piece. Very important uh, for long-term reputation and brand, right? So, and that's very important as uh, when I came to Wells Fargo, I built a team who do you call the people that used to work for you right so you yep. call them and if 
and they when we call them we they they come so it's like extreme extreme privilege you know when you you feel very very honored because the people they have choices to work anywhere and they 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 chose to come and work with you again so that is incredible incredible feeling you know when 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 you have that yeah yeah i i made a video a few weeks back talking about the highlights of my success in quant finance and kind of the whole message of it was kind of the best things i've ever received was always that appraisal and that approval from people around you that have worked with you because they really understand the work the struggle all the challenges you face when you get someone like a senior manager that comes and says, Hey, you did a really good job on this. I think that to me was worth so much more than, you know, someone comes along and says, you got a 20% increase in bonus or something. It's like, yeah, it's great. But it, it does mean a lot to get that mm, feedback mm, from mm, respectable mm, people. Mm, mm. And for me, it's uh, the, uh, the feedback, uh, the people that around you, you know, people that they don't have to work for you, but they want to work with you you know, or for you, yeah. that's, that's incredible, incredible. So I still remember even in, uh, uh, this is why the people side, this is especially people that is in the quant side, that uh, the people side is very, very important. Uh, technical side is the easy part. We know how to deal with the math, you know? <laughs> that's the easy part. We know how to deal with algorithm. We can coach. So <laughs> that's the easy part. What make it, 10 times more complicated is dealing with people, convince other people. Yeah. So, so the people skill is as important as, right? So, so I think that's, that's, that's key. Yeah. So for people that don't know Wells Fargo, so this is specifically your team is mm. somewhat viewed in the industry as like the team to work for. So I don't know if you know that, but there are people that have been murmurings around the industry that it's like, if you want to go somewhere as a quant, the place to go is Wells Fargo. And so how, how do you. you how do you work to build such a culture? Because one thing well, I don't I don't think a lot of people realize either is your team specifically, you guys are so research focused, so research oriented, but you're also giving back to the business unit, solving all these problems. Mm -hmm. And I think industry wide, there's this problem that for quants, we feel like often neglected because mm. we're not being listened to and the research isn't going on. It's kind of like mm. we're a secondary function mm. of the bank. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I think uh, a, a few things, right? The, uh, I, I will start with this one first. Uh, in, in an industry like bank, it's very different from industry that uh, engineer and create product, right? Drug mm -hmm. industry, they create product, they sell product. Apple, create iPhone, they sell iPhone. Ford Motor Company, they design car, they make car, they sell car. Banks and financial institution, what do we sell? Yeah, soft services. Services. Yeah. And where is that coming from? From people, right? Mm -hmm. So so in a, an organization like this, people side is so important. Having a, a really, really good team is so important and, and retaining good team is so important. So when I arrived in Wells Fargo, that's what the, uh, the first thing that we talk, thinking about, well, building MRM, yes, we can build MRM, you know, uh, how, how good this can be. At that time when I came to Wells Fargo, it's, it's Wells Fargo almost have no, no MRM, you know, at all. So we built it in, uh, in, 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 in two years, we, we have horizontal exam regulators and, uh, and we got uh, among the 12 banks in the US and we got satisfactory rating at that time was the only bank has satisfactory rating back in the early 2016, right? In two years, yeah. we, can, we can do all of this. Uh, it's, 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 the key is not on the technical side, it's not on all of these things, but it's really on the people and the culture. And on the people side, this is very important. People spend time in the office at work more than anything else in the world, anything else in their life, right? You spend, mm -hmm. I don't know, at least 10 hours a day, maybe, you know, yeah. oh, at yeah. work. So, so that's more than anything else. If you do that, you better off make things that you do very, very rewarding, very, very satisfying. So the focus is for, for me, and for the manager that work in the, in, in, in the team is really, we need to really focus on the people side. 
support our team member. So as part of the quant side, on the quant side, what is the most exciting thing for quants? It's research. Research building model, <laughs> yeah. right? If you work in model development, yeah. the time for model development is really small. You have to deal with all kind of stuff that you don't want to do, data cleaning and all of those things, put model into production, model monitoring. Man, it's tough, okay? Oh, and yeah. then when you talk about model, and the model building time is very small. And then when you talk about model validation, man, this is will be, it can be even more boring. Yeah. You're reading somebody else document. You're not even building model. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you cannot operate like that. You have to, what the people want. So the approach that we have is we approach it very, very differently. We approach it in model validation. What do we do in model validation? So you need to really, the, the strategic arm of the company in terms of what is the direction of future model that the comp that you would like to have in the company. In model development, you have no time to do research. The pressure of delivering model to be put in the business and operationalized model is tremendous, tremendous pressure. Yeah? yeah. And you're busy, you have deadline, you have to do that. Model validation side, they don't have to run model in production they can focus on the technical side, but you cannot just focus on the technical side for academic reason. You have to look at it thinking about, okay, we're going to be two, three, four, five years ahead so that we can lay the ground for what it ought to be. When people, we know that machine learning is coming, it will be coming way back then. It will be coming very, very strong. So what do we do? What are the challenges? Machine learning interpretability will be big deal. And mm -hmm. you going in a in regulated industry, you going to get squashed and you're going to get scrutinized left and right because our model impact people's life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So explainability are very, very important, interpretability very important. So way ahead, we prepare ourselves so that the model risk management is not a burden, but it's an enabler for the company to move as fast as they can. We want people to drive car very, very fast, but we want them to drive it very, very safely, right? So exactly. if you're thinking about Sebastian Fatal team, you know, <laughs> we put the, the expert driver with the expert crew pit. When the car makes a stop, it's going, car will get the uh, uh, quick things and will be in a pristine condition that it will be safe when you, when you race again. So that's how we approach model validation and research in model validation. That the time, because model validation not burdened with the production with pressure, they can do a lot more academic and research thing to think about what will be two, three, four years. So that's where, where our research is very, very uh, with certain objective. We're not doing research for doing research. Our research is very, very different from, from academic research. So you can see it in uh, our, some of our things that we publish in archive, very, very practical real world, mm -hmm. right? Very, very practical real world. You don't put something fancy, uh, LSTM for the sake of LSTM so that you can publish, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's <laughs> in academia, you do that, okay? <laughs> in academia, you do that. You put something that make it fancy that you don't have to just so that you can publish. Real world is very different. So that why our things that we publish, you can see it as very, very practical things that we can do. This is real life. So, so that's how, and bring value because we enable now the model development say, move faster, why don't you do it? Yeah. You know, in other areas say, oh, I'm worried about using deep learning. You say, do deep learning, okay? We know how this thing works. We know how to make this one as a self-explainable model. In fact, that is the most self-explainable model is ReLU deep learning. So, so that make, you know, so research with purpose. So that's why it's driving the direction where the organization should go in the modeling. Yeah, I agree with that.
So how do you see machine learning unfolding for finance? Like which areas do you think will be the most impacted by it? Well, I think this is the thing that uh, sometimes uh, people look at area that's the uh, the most obvious that may not be the right place, right? So, uh, and this is why I'm, I'm talking about probably narrowly, but th there are a lot of opportunity. Uh, and, but in, I'll, I'll put in general first, and then we, we look at it in a in very specific way. Uh, area that uh, feature engineering is difficult mm -hmm. or time consuming because the, the power of machine learning is really feature engineering. Mm -hmm. And not the classifier, in my view, it's not the classifier because if your feature is good, you don't need complicated classifier. You only need logistic regression if your feature is very good. Simplest model will do it. Unless your feature is terrible, you yeah. need a complicated model. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 that so the power of machine learning are really to help to do feature engineering. So which area that feature engineering is is the most time consuming, is most difficult? Well, things that dealing with uh, unstructured data, natural language processing. And banks use, we process information. We process that, we process unstructured data a lot too, in addition to, to structured data. So area that really feature engineering difficult, that's the area that, uh, that, 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 that will have a lot of opportunity because that area also the least touch, okay. right? The least touch by previous modeling. And then we can say, well, I can do something that will replace traditional statistics to do machine learning, okay? That's people, people do to that route quickly, you know, okay. Uh, people looking at the uh, credit scoring, people looking at fraud. Well, I, I have a different opinion, okay? Credit scoring, it's very easy to build model with high performance, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But then you lay it out, uh, layer it with, regulatory oops i cannot use this variable then you yeah. see the degradation oops i have to put constraint monotonicity okay yeah. suddenly your gbn machine that whoop the performance okay so so that's the area that very heavily regulated very controlled in terms of variable very controlled in terms of constraints so your life is not that much plus it's the area that has been featured engineer for many 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 years the field is 20 30 years old yeah. people put yeah. all kind of thing binning put spline and all of those things on the feature manually yeah. so when you apply plus the constraints of regulation what you can and cannot use on the variable and apply the monotonicity the constraint and all those things you will not get much yeah right so yeah. i would argue unless in the new world, yeah. If you, if somebody have, you for example, you are uh, you a uh, new area. You don't have a strong modeler. You don't have a, uh, uh, a history of this. Then yeah, machine learning will help quickly to to do feature engineering very quickly. But fraud is a uh, different uh, different area. Fraud, cyber, financial crime. This is the area that keep changing, dynamically changing. To do feature engineering take times. Those machine learning will help to do a fast feature engineering. So area, I would say area where where features dynamically changing, rapidly changing, and then other area that feature is 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 much uh, much uh, much uh, more difficult to uh, to to extract. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I try to explain. I always feel like I struggle because I feel like I'm in the middle camp. On one hand, you have people that are so excited about machine learning and they're like running off the rails into like crazy directions thinking it's going to solve everything. And then you've got kind of the old statisticians, the old bankers that are stuck in the, we only use statistics. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like it's so hard to be in the middle to explain exactly what you explained, which is we're trying to extract new information with that feature engineering. Yeah. And so it's like, hey guys, on this side, we can improve our models, but it's not going to change the world. Yeah, I think it's so hard being stuck in that realistic camp of how do you uh, convince uh, both sides of it. Of course, of course, but I think people just need to be open-minded because it's it's all, all you know, there's a value 
some area the value is be bigger than the other and you just have to be uh, I think technically it has to be it has to be very fluent to to be able to lead that. For example, I I wrote a, a paper that was published in the, in in archive on on deep learning, deep ReLU network. People think, oh, it's, this is difficult model to explain and all those things. At the end of the day, what is deep deep ReLU network? Local linear model. When yeah. we talk about local linear model, oh, we done this thing all the time. We do segmented regression. Yeah. There's nothing new. <laughs> We do segmented regression. The difference is in segmented regression, we probably segment it manually and we come up with five segments. In deep learning, we can come up with a thousand segments or a million segments. And yeah. of course, you don't not we don't want to do that. You want to control the model, regularize it so that we know when the model fail. This is very important because we're not talking about model performance only. We're talking about we know all model wrong, and when they fail, they create damage to the customer or the or to the institution. So we need to know how the model will fail and control it. How the model will fail. This is at the heart of regularization, right? Yeah. Simplifying <laughs> the model so that the model will be not only simpler, but at the end of the day, is safer because we control. We know we control how the model will fail. Yeah. And I think that's one of the keys I think the machine learning community as a whole is missing for banking and finance is that we are so concerned with our impact. Where it's like when you're in technology, you can do something fun and exciting. And if it fails, you, know, you don't get a good search result or the proper image recommendation doesn't come up. But yeah. for finance, that explainability piece, that simplifying and that robustness is crucial oh, for kind yeah. of that model monitoring. Yeah, robustness is so critical because at the end of the day, and this is COVID-19 is perfect example, right? Perfect. COVID-19 is robustness at the extreme. Environment change. How is your model going to work in the current environment? It's extreme, extreme yeah, robustness, yeah. you know? Yeah. But that's what the end of the day, when you put model in production, the model will be subjected to changing environment and your model cannot fail. And this is my problem with people that talking about auto ML, mm -hmm. yeah? Do all the feature automatic feature selection and hyperparameter tuning, and then you just okay. This is the best model. So I run my tool. Let the tool run twenty different model, and I pick the one that is the best in terms of AUC yeah. or MSC. Man, that is the most dangerous thing that you can do. It's the most dangerous thing that you can do. How can you measure? such a complicated machine learning with a single number, a single AUC, single area under the curve. That is very, very irresponsible because what really important is we know how the model will fail and we control it, right? So single right. number like that cannot be, that mean cannot be used to choose. So that's one. Two, you're choosing based on the static part. I split the data training and testing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Real world, your data change. So the best model that you choose, you put it in production, it can be the most miserable model you have, right? So yeah. you have to test model for robustness and you cannot just simply, okay, yeah. let the tool run, okay? Uh, 20 different models and I choose the one with the, the best performance. I think that's completely garbage. Yeah, I'd agree. I had a bank reach out to me at one not related to what I worked at. And they were asking the exact question. They said, Dimitri, how do we even handle this? And we've got banks at these you know, conferences saying they're gonna do all this automated modeling and development and we're a validation team. How do you validate a model if the target variable is changing and all the input variables are changing at the same time? I said, I wouldn't allow it. I would just say you can't use it and go back. You need that structure. The, the model development, the model validation process is the exact same. Because for me, machine learning is just a tool a statistician uses, just one more mo modeling methodology. and mm -hmm. following those same steps and those same processes, so you get responsible modeling. Mm -hmm. Because this is very important. This is why I, sp I speak a lot about interpretability. And sometimes I have to, to bite my tongue, you know? <laughs> and and I, 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 I probably say this one and I probably will make a lot of enemies because I'm saying this, you know? And uh, some of the enemy, even my good friend, uh, because of this, right? So people talk about explainable AI. Mm -hmm. I have to bite my tongue because what happened is 
I have a black box and then I apply post hoc analysis tool to explain this black box, be it lime, sharp, and sharp is really, really so oversold by everybody. Well, these tools are not exact. Mm -hmm. These tools are inconsistent because based on approximation, perturbation, not exact, inconsistent, and can be misleading. Right. Really, you want to do this? So I am a big proponent. That's to me, it's like cooking. You put MSG to make it taste good. Yeah. Yeah. I put MSG. That's explainer. That's post hoc explainer. It's MSG to uh, machine learning. Yeah, to a black box. Are you going to eat food with MSG? Well, make it taste good. You know, <laughs> once in a while it's okay. You know, but you don't may not want. I don't know. You know, but at least I don't. Okay, occasionally I would. Okay, so to make it taste good. No, I don't. So I I'm a big proponent of making it self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. inherently interpretable machine learning and we can do this you know so that you don't need to put msg in your in your in your machine learning and and i this is why we we we, we publish as well because i feel like it's we have to educate the community so that uh we we we, we deploying responsible model right. so that's that's part of the things that we feel that uh, I, I feel of uh, obligation to, to do that. Those we publish some of those things. Yeah, I appreciate it. I read some of your guys' papers because you always share them on LinkedIn and I see them come up and I'll go and read them and try to reference them to other people in the industry as well. So we can kind of get more people on that same responsibility kind of token here for machine learning. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a big proponent of machine learning. Like I told you, you know, I, I did my PhD dissertation on this, yeah. you know, so I'm a big proponent, but let's use it responsibility and safely, you know, don't you, this is the thing. Uh, I don't know, people, people touting a big, I'm making enemy again here, okay, but I'll, 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 I'll do this one. People do a deep neural network. I, I, I love neural network, okay, so, so because I told you I did PhD on this one. But when you do a deep neural networks, do you know it is coming up with depend on the size of network, a thousand or million local linear equation. You partition it into small region and each region local linear model. That's what deep ReLU does. A lot of region, a lot of local linear model never get exposed by sample whatsoever. Or many of them probably only one sample or two sample. Well, you are a trained statistician. Do you trust linear model with observation less than number of variable? No. We don't. No. <laughs> because that line can go anywhere. Yeah. That's what happened in neural networks without proper regularization. Yeah. You know, people apply all of this tool like, okay, I can tune it, I can split the data, let me run using early stopping, which is cheating. Okay, early yeah, stopping yeah. with this data and stop the training uh, to get the best prediction. Well, do you know that this is a very dangerous thing because you have all of this thing, you know, local linear model that never get exposed to data. So, yeah. and, and, and it will fail in, in that area, right? So, and it's very difficult to test the robustness because testing is robustness is what, what can you do? You do counterfactual, or you do adversarial tests, you need an exhaustive test to do that. And that's not easy in the complex machine learning. That's why I feel like control, regularized model, really understand this thing so that we can use it safely. So yeah. sorry for, for, for blabbering on this because it's something that I'm very passionate with the, with the hype on machine learning and all those things, you know, we have to be, we have to be responsible. Yeah, no, I fall right into it because, so I, I started my whole career doing CCAR modeling. Mm. So that whole regulatory wave came in. And so everything I do, I look at it kind of from a time series perspective. And a similar perspective on this is I always talk about stationarity. So your data needs to be stationary you have to transform it and make these methods. And it's that same process. People go, oh, I couldn't get it stationary. I just threw stuff in the regression on time series. Right? For CCAR, you've got, I don't know, 20 to 120 <laughs> points at most. And they say, oh, it fits perfect. It's great. It's amazing. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you deploy it, then you, uh, it's, uh, you're going to be really, really humble because your model will be miserable, right? Yeah, yeah. And so then we'd have, yeah, deep ass would come up in six months and it would fail. And so I always remember telling people the story, a buddy of mine, we'd be sitting side by side in our cubes working and we'd be testing these models. 
And so it would have perfect p-values. And of course, I'm jumping up and down screaming, it's not stationary, don't use it. And they, so we would run these models at D faster year end. And we'd have this kind of competition of who can get the highest p-value. So it'd be all exciting to, I got a, like a 0.75 p-value. My colleague's like, I got, point, I think he got like a 0.99 one. So I'm like, we're almost guaranteeing this is the incorrect model structure. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but people just get so excited about, you know, that, that, I mean, time series is an exact, probably a pretty good comparison to machine learning. You can get it to fit really, really well, but the yeah. model's not robust. There's not a lot of logic behind it. You have to do all that additional responsible testing. Absolutely. Yeah. And you Absolutely. don't need the, the best fit. You just need a robust model to get you through <laughs> yeah. those few years of usage. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah, absolutely. Model that's, that sound, right? <laughs> that, that sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So to wrap up this podcast here, do you have any last words or advice for a student that's coming out of school that would like to get into quantitative finance? Well, I think a, a, a few things in, in, in there, right? Well, the, on the technical side, I'm assuming you're given because you're taking class, you learn, you have the technical side. And, and people will have a different depth depending because the job in, 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 in this is very, very broad, right? Job in quant finance uh, or in data science are very, very broad from uh, something and, and, and people specializing. So, so depend in terms of, of the depth, some people would like to pursue graduate school, some people want to do PhD. So it's, 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 it's the market, it has market, different market on that. So you just need to know where you, your, your strength is. And then the thing that's very, very important that you don't learn in school are a couple of things. One is the communication. The most important thing is the communication, how you communicate with people, right? This is, this is something that if, if you look at, uh, I'm, I'm talking, I'm making self-reflection here, Dimitri, yeah? I speak with very, very heavy accent, Indonesian accent. My wife laughs at me, my kids laugh at me all the time, you know, make fun of me because I speak with, uh, with all this uh, thick Indonesian accent. But I can speak, I can explain to people complex stuff into something very simple. I can motivate people, I can influence people. So be a geek, because that's a quant job. Be a geek, but who can speak? Yeah, be a geek who can speak, because that will be going a long, long way. Of course, you have to be technically very, very sound, but you have to do the other side. In particular, for some of you that do uh, going your, your, your foot step to, to get to the door. Yes, technically you have to be able to explain, but you have, you have to be able to, to engage your audience. So I think that communication skill, be, uh, both in the, uh, in the, in the oral and, 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 and writing stuff, you know it, in real world, you have to write a lot of document. Right? Yeah. yeah, 80, 100 plus pages. And, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless, you model developer, you model validator, you have to write a lot of documents. So, so writing skill is very important. Communication skill is very important because you deal with so many stakeholders. You have to convince to the business, right? right. You have to sell it to the business. You have to, you have to defend it into if you work in model developer department you have to you have to you have to defend it uh when you get scrutinized including with auditor or with regulator if you are in the regulated uh, entity if not you still have to you have to convince other people so so that's very important the the the, the thinking ability and this is something that's very very hard to get from sometime from technical people to be able to think, to formulate problem. Solving for a given problem is very easy. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, formulating problem that you need, that we need to solve is a lot harder. So I think is, and that, how would you, how would you prepare yourself for that? If you want to go really have a long career and successful, career in the long run. Technical side, that's a, that's, it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. Yeah. So you have to work on the, uh, on the sufficient condition, communication skill, and all of those 
all of those things that that, that need it. But the technical skill is, is very important as well, but it really depends, you know, in the sophistication of the company and where the job you you need to be, you know. Mm -hmm. So some area require deep technical, other area require a little bit more generalist, you know. It's very, very wide. I cannot say how do you do that, but look at your strength and build your strength in that area and 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 build career in the area that you can you can you can prosper with your strength. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for coming on the channel. So uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I, my apology if you cannot ask all the question, all the things because we probably digress on a on certain topic. But thank you, this is fun conversation. I hope it will be very useful. All right, thank you.